everybody. My name is David Freeman. I'm the managing editor of the Impact and Innovation section of the Huffington Post. I'm also the moderator for today's panel, which is about uh, what can be done about the chronic pain epidemic. Uh, this event is presented jointly with the Huffington Post, and this program is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohn forums. Dr. Cohn passed away in January, but we're pleased to have in the audience Roberta Cohn, excuse me, and uh, their daughter Leslie uh, today with us. Uh, the event is also presented and associated with Harvard Health Publications. Uh, the forum, the Huffington Post, Harvard Health Publications are streaming this event live on the website and on their websites, and it's also streaming on Facebook, so people can feel free to join in. Uh, and joining us today, we have four panelists, uh, three here and one remotely. Uh, to my immediate right is Cindy Steinberg, who is the National Director of Policy and Advocacy, U.S. Pain Foundation, a member of the Interagency Pain Research Coordinating Committee of NIH, and Policy Council Chair of the Massachusetts Pain Initiative. Uh, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vaughn Rees, to her right, uh, is an addiction specialist and lecturer on social and behavioral sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Anne Louise Oaklander, who is Associate Professor of Neurology and Director of the Nerve Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And joining remotely uh, from a secure location is uh, <laughs> Linda Porter, Director of the Office of Pain Policy of the uh, National Institutes of Health and Co-Chair of the National Pain Strategy. I should also mention today that we were originally going to be joined by Josephine Briggs, Director of NIH Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, but she couldn't be here, so thanks to her as well. So um, uh, the program will include a, uh, a brief Q&A at the end. And you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. Um, and um, uh, so let's get, let's get started. Uh, chronic pain affects millions of people. I guess it's actually tens of millions, but I think we'll find out about that. So let's take a look at a clip from the University of New England of someone who lives with chronic pain. Through the years, my job has always been working with my hands. I went to high school and then the army and then became a plumber and at work I was working in a confined space too long and I went to stand up and I couldn't stand up straight and ended up going to the doctor after and they found out it was a herniated disc. So from there I had a one back surgery where they took part of the disc out and uh, I was good for a year. I went back to work and sitting on my toolbox I went to get out and my leg gave out. Went back to the doctor and they said a disc fragment broke off, you need another surgery. So they said we have to do a fusion and they put the rods and screws in. They took uh, some more x-rays, like six months, eight months, and then a year. Said the fusion didn't take. Um, your screws are moving in your vertebrae. I think it was 2001 was the last surgery. I woke up with a brace around my waist. I said, what's that for? And they said, well, that's temporary. We want to make sure that it, it's going to have time to fuse. I still wear the brace to this day. I never got back to work after that because I didn't recover. So I wear a $2,000 brace to be able to stand or sit. For the aches and pains, I, I can only take Tylenol and Advil because I can't take uh, medications because I have another disease, it's narcolepsy. But I need something because it's almost like an arthritis building. It's hard to explain it to some people that don't have chronic pain. So. Um... Cindy, you work on federal and state pain policy, and it's, you're also someone who lives with chronic pain. Tell us about uh, the scope of the problem and also your own experience. Sure. I learned about chronic pain because of an accident that happened to me more than 15 years ago, yet I still live every day of my life with pain. I had a career in business that I really loved, and one day I was opening up a file drawer, and unbeknownst to me, moving men had stacked cubicle walls against the back of the file drawer. And uh, I opened it, and the cabinet and all the walls fell on me, pinning me underneath the cabinet and the walls uh, and crushing me and causing extensive damage to my uh, spine and back. And then I spent five years searching for help, trying many different therapies, and what was a difficult and confusing and sometimes demeaning experience. I finally found a terrific doctor who helped me, but he insisted that I give up my career. So uh, he was right, and I walked away from a career I love. I hung a sign at a local library that I was starting a support group for people with pain. And people just started showing up. So people with carpal tunnel and migraine and disc disease and rheumatoid arthritis and cancer and neuropathy, 
and with conditions I'd never heard of, like vulvodynia and CRPS and Ehlers-Danlos and Marfans and pudendal neuralgia, and more and more people just kept coming each month. Uh, it was all ages, teens to their 90s, men and women, all socioeconomic backgrounds, and it's been 16 years, and I'm still running that group. At this point, more than 350 people have just come to this small local group in the Boston area. Um, and a remarkably common experience for everyone that comes to the group is that they've had to see at least four or five practitioners before they can find help if they ever do. Uh, it's frustrating, it's exhausting, and it's costly. Pain devastates the very fabric of people's lives. Marriages sometimes fall apart. Friendships are lost. Many are unable to work and earn a living. They can't care for their children and their families. Their self-esteem suffers. They're unable to enjoy things that give them pleasure and they become housebound, um, isolated, and sometimes depressed. And then, of course, there is the relentless physical experience, which may be burning, stabbing, gnawing, knifing, and other unpleasant sensations. I equate it to feeling like you're a prisoner trapped in your body, but it's worse than that. You are a prisoner who is being tortured 24-7, and there's no means of escape. And yet, when people seek help from healthcare providers, uh, they're often met with skepticism and doubt and mistrust and an appalling lack of compassion. Um, David talked about the numbers. The scope of chronic pain in America is enormous. Um, pain is the number one reason why Americans visit their doctor. It's the leading cause of disability. Uh, the Institute of Medicine has documented that 100 million people live with chronic pain, and approximately 10% of those have pain so severe they're disabled by it. Um, yet, chronic pain is largely misunderstood by policymakers, the media, and, and the public at large. You know, there are many challenges in treating chronic pain, uh, but a critical one now is the tendency to conflate the opioid epidemic with the pain epidemic. People with substance abuse disorder and those living with chronic pain are largely two separate groups of people with very little overlap. Um, opioid pain medications are one of many possible treatments for pain. Uh, they don't help everyone, and for the people they do help, uh, they don't completely take the pain away. But for many pain sufferers who take them responsibly and legitimately, they're a lifeline that allows them to function and have some quality of life. So that's interesting. You talk about this kind of conflation of, um, uh, of the opioid issue and chronic pain. Uh, Vaughn, you're an addiction specialist, so what's your take on that? How do you balance this idea of wanting to make sure people get the, the, the help that they need without stigmatizing them and also protect them against needless risk of, of addiction? Well, uh, David, it's certainly become a, a, a big problem in the United States in recent years, and we've seen uh, an enormous increase in, uh, in uptake of the use of um, opioid analgesics uh, in the general population. Um, Clearly, and Cindy makes a very good point, that, uh, that, uh, that these, these are medications which serve enormous good for people who have problems of chronic pain. Unfortunately, what we've seen is that uh, the use of opioid analgesics is not necessarily confined to the population of patients that have chronic pain uh, problems. And we're seeing uh, an increase in use of opioid uh, medications among a substance using community. Um, we've seen over, over the past decade and a half something like a fourfold increase, not just in uh, sales of opioid medications, but in uh, the rate of use of those medications. Um, and indeed um, overdose deaths um, attributable to um, opioid analgesic medications. So uh, as we've seen uh, a proliferation of uh, uh, use of opioid analgesics for the, to uh, p potentially to benefit uh, patients with chronic pain problems, we've seen uh, similarly problems in, uh, of a substance use uh, problem among the substance use community. So finding that balance of uh, providing uh, appropriate medications for chronic pain patients while minimizing or preventing uh, consequences, uh, adverse consequences of uh, substance use is critical from a public health point of view. Mm -hmm. And so, Annalise, um, you're, you're a, a neurologist studying pain, so you have your own unique perspective, um, and you treat pain patients. So what, what is your perspective on this issue, on chronic pain? Well, I think they brought me in to back clean up <laughs> and so I'm a physician, actually a peripheral nerve specialist, and uh, my interest in pain really came out of knowing 
that quite a bit of unexplained chronic pain is due to abnormalities affecting the uh, nerves that carry pain sensation, which is the so-called small fibers, the thinly myelinated and unmyelinated axons. So I have a very different background than most pain specialists who are anesthesiologists. And indeed, they've brought their tools that they learned for managing acute and operative pain into chronic pain with the best of intentions. But unfortunately, the studies really hadn't been done to look at the efficacy and the safety of a lot of these treatments, for instance, such as nerve blocks, for the long haul. And so I think we've learned, maybe a bit later than we would have hoped, that we have to start thinking about new approaches. Some of the work from my lab is helping to address that. One of the studies, uh, or I should say that much of the work we do relies a lot on bringing objective measures into the pain field, of which the most useful are tiny little skin biopsies taken under anesthesia from the lower leg, and they come into my lab. I direct this facility uh, here at Mass General, and we can actually get objective evidence to know when a patient might have neuropathic pain as a cause of their particular pain problem. This has turned out to be very important. For instance, it helped us to identify a new type of small fiber neuropathy that actually affects kids and young people, arguably the worst people, uh, to be stuck with this chronic pain problem. And also in a prospective study, we were able to use these methods to show that about 40% of people with the label of fibromyalgia have objective evidence that in fact they have this kind of peripheral nerve injury. What's the point? We're not just trying to call it another name, but the point is, is that if you get diagnosed with a peripheral nerve neuropathy, there's a path forward and there is objective treatments that in some cases can really help people to get beyond the problems which you two were speaking about. So it's a, a way to new treatments and also to destigmatize this in a way to have this objective measure of, of pain. Absolutely. Um, and I echo your comments that in the past many of these patients with what I call mystery pain, meaning there's no clear, you had a, a very clear cause of it, but many of the patients develop chronic pain problems out of nowhere and the part of their body that's, that, that is painful doesn't have an apparent injury. So as Cindy said, this used to be attributed to psychopathology. And I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't address that, but I do know that a lot of these people, in fact, have neurologic, potentially treatable causes of their chronic pain. Okay, well, uh, and as you mentioned batting cleanup, actually that falls to Linda, who was uh, kind enough to join us from a vacation in her, uh, I think it's in Wyoming, so thank you very much. So you're, you're the co-chair of the National Pain Strategy, which was released last March um, by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, this is the first uh, plan from the government uh, to, to reduce the chronic pain burden. So why did the government need to get involved to create a plan like this? And what, what is it, what did, what's the result of that plan's uh, release? Um, so, you know, the government recognized along with the external stakeholders across the country that we really need a, a change in the way we perceive pain, the way we manage pain, and the way we help to prevent pain. Um, as Cindy pointed out, you know, there are hundreds of millions of people who live with pain. On a daily basis, there are tens of millions who have severe pain that's not treated well enough for them to prevent disability, to keep them from their lives. That some can't go to work, some can't go to school, some drop out of their social activities. Um, despite the fact that we spend hundreds of billions of dollars every year on better pain care, um, we are not preventing these people from suffering. So, so we have a healthcare system that's not addressing some of the main problems, but, but it goes beyond that. Um, we also have, on the other side of this, uh, sort of a, a culture of prescribing opioids as sort of a, um, a, a practice that has become um, more prevalent over the years rather than providing patients um, with alternatives to opioids to reduce that reliance on opioids. So this, this prescribing practice, I think, has, has made a big contribution to the opioid epidemic. Um, on the other hand, we need to balance that if we are to help 
people move away from this solar reliance on opioids with better alternatives to pain care. Um, so some of the major problems I think that were recognized that we need to deal with is that most pain care now is delivered in the primary care setting. And um, the physicians who are providing care at that level, they don't have the appropriate training in order to manage complex pain conditions, to really identify the individual nature of pain and the individual responses of people to their treatments. Um, they don't have the time to spend with people who have complex pain, persistent pain, and they don't have the resources to offer up other therapies, whether it be physical therapy or mindfulness or cognitive behavioral therapy, they're not available to them. Um, and so at that level, we're, we're dealing not only with a lack of ability to treat patients appropriately, um, but we're also dealing with the stigma that people with pain live with. So what we needed um, and what was recognized, not just by the federal government, again, this is a national, not a federal pain strategy, is that we need to move away from an approach to pain on a unimodal, everybody has the same treatment, everybody has the same problem, um, to a multidisciplinary approach that's patient-centered based on the needs of the individual person and that can provide them with a set of alternatives that um, best approach their patient, patient strat, their, their personal strategies. Um, in order to do this, we really need to approach it from a number of different directions. We need to um, provide access to care for, for the many, many people who don't have appropriate care, whether it's because they live in rural settings, whether their insurance companies don't cover the appropriate care or enough of the appropriate care that they get. They may be restricted on many levels for so many physical therapy treatments, um, things that we know are helpful like yoga and mindfulness are, are very rarely paid for by, um, by most people's healthcare setting, uh, healthcare providers. Um, so we need, to, we need to take this to a level where this multidisciplinary approach is provided in a biopsychosocial model of pain. So pain is not just a physical problem. Um, it's, it, it includes, it like, needs a psychological approach. Um, it, it's really sort of a multimodal, again, patient-centered and integrated approach. Uh, we also need a, a better research base so that the, the programs and the offerings that we do have for people with pain are appropriate to their needs. We understand the risks, we understand the benefits, and we understand the costs, and we can weigh all those things out together. So the National Pain Strategy takes all those different aspects and approaches them from with the lead of the federal government over a, a number a number of different um, variables, and, and I hope we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, but, but the last thing I want to mention at this point is that we do, as Anne Louise mentioned, have evidence um, to improve some of the approaches that we use for pain care. We aren't necessarily getting that evidence base out to the clinic. And so this is another place that the National Pain Strategy hopes to make improvements in health care. Um, if Josie Briggs had been able to attend today, I think she would have made a point to let you know that the center that she directs at the NIH um, has focused a lot of attention and a lot of its resources on looking at the benefits and risks of uh, therapies that are, are considered perhaps non-traditional or that are uh, part of a multidisciplinary approach. So we know, for instance, through, through clinical studies that massage can be helpful, that acupuncture can be helpful, that yoga can be helpful, and that mindfulness can be helpful in a lot of these situations. But access to those programs and payment for those programs is, is something that we're really missing from the big picture. But, but the evidence base is expanding, and I think that's an important piece of the, um, the move forward. All right. Well, it sounds complicated, especially as you're saying, getting it out to the um, the primary care physicians to um, to you know mm -hmm. put this plan of action. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. But let's turn to a, a clip now. That for the the rest of this uh, session, will be more about um, uh, ways to address the epidemic. So here's a clip from KVIE documentary called "Oh My Aching Back," uh, which is provided courtesy of the Huffington Post. So it talks about exercise as a way to treat uh, chronic pain. Three, two, one, hit it, go. Don't let your knee deviate. 
Yes, yeah, go, go, go. You got it. Hurry, come on, get the bar set up for your own body. The human body is an extraordinary machine. It's engineered to bend and move. But when things go wrong, there can be mystery pain. Kelly gets a little special attention because she's coming back from an injury, a little flare up. I just have that phantom back pain that didn't, didn't come from injury, didn't come from an accident. At Folsom Physical Therapy, these folks are making an investment together, using sweat equity to conquer that chronic ache. Couldn't sleep at night, I mean, wicked pain. And recover from major injuries. Two spinal fractures, four pelvic fractures, and a hand fracture. So what would possess people with debilitating pain to put themselves through all this, risking more soreness in the process? I don't have that pain anymore, it's zero. It's immediate, and I get strong right away. So let's, let's go back to Linda a bit. You know, as you're talking about this pain strategy, is, again, it sounds complicated, and uh, I'm wondering, you know, in my experience going to the doctor, uh, I don't have chronic pain, but there's a really, you know, push to get people in and out pretty quickly, which I guess whatever happens to Obamacare is still going to be an issue. So how, what exactly is go needs to change from that level? Um, how, is the, how is the strategy involved in the national pain strategy going to work? How is the implementation, implementation going to work? So the, the implementation structure is, is in place now and is moving forward. Um, it's being coordinated through the Office of the Assistant Secretary. And um, it, it will actually involve themes that were set up in the report, the National Pain Strategy Report, that cover a number of different areas. So we're looking at population research so that we can better understand the prevalence and the issues surrounding pain, as well as be able to monitor over time how different interventions are of benefit to pain. We're also looking at provider education, which I think is foundational to improving how um, we care for patients. So there will be resources um, made at different levels and multi -dis and disciplines um, for people who do care with pain. Um, we're also looking, and I think this is a really important piece, is the, the payment and the service delivery for pain care. And I think this gets a little bit more um, to your targeted question that we are um, running pilot studies through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to see how public and private payers actually now cover pain treatments and to make adjustments in how those are paid for through those insurers um, and for reimbursement for the doctors according to the best practices. So how does a multidisciplinary approach to pain, how do we pay for that What's the cost benefit to the insurer? And most important, what's the outcome to the patient? So those questions are being addressed with long, along with better prevention strategies. So these are prevention strategies in the workplace. These are prevention strategies, strategies that are self-management based, which includes things like healthier lifestyles, exercise, of course, would be included in that. Um, and also on public awareness, and I, I think this is also a key piece to the, to the strategy of, um, how people who do not suffer with chronic pain perceive those who do, the stigma attached with it, and um, especially for those who are in need of and taking opioids for their pain, there's an additional level of stigma there. Um, but also helping people with pain communicate with their physicians so they can ask what their options are, um, where they can get access to those options, and, and how, again, the, this patient-centered, team-based approach can Im improve um, their situation and their lives. Can you, can you mention, uh, talk a bit about disparities in pain, um, chronic pain? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so disparities is kind of a global term um, that includes uh, differential responses to pain and, and pain treatments uh, based on genetics, racial differences, cultural differences. But I, I think the, the biggest focus of the national pain strategies for disparities is how to we how do we best help people who are in vulnerable populations, whether it be young children who can't communicate their pain, um, whether it be older people who um, have different responses to drugs, how do we best manage them? How do we reach out to them perhaps through a community setting? Um, but also people in um, racial, gr racial groups or ethnic groups, low socioeconomic groups, or live in rural areas who are having difficulty 
getting even a primary care physician um, and especially getting a, a sort of a specialized program set up for them because they don't have access or they can't afford access. So disparities is a broad term when it's when it's uh, addressed to pain because it's partly the um, individual disparities, but it's it's partly the care piece of it as well. And this is a huge issue that the pain strategy hopes to begin to address. So it sounds like a pretty complicated plan. Um, and um, I want to ask you about funding. It's a big plan. Who's going to pay for it? And what about uh, about research upstream from the from the implementation of the plan? What what what's uh, the funding picture look like? So uh, it's a great plan. Uh, it was put together by 80 experts from the medical community, the patient community, the scientific community, uh, and I applaud Linda for, for co-leading that effort. Um, but right now, the truth is, it's an unfunded mandate. So basically, there is no budget allocated at HHS right now to fund the National Pain Strategy. The kinds of things Linda was talking about were sort of small demonstrations here and there, but they're not going to fund it. And we heard from the IOM that $600 billion annually is spent on pain now because of lost productivity and direct health care costs. I gave the example of the people in my pain group. Everyone's had seed four or five practitioners before they find help. So there's a lot of wasted money we're spending right now that uh, if people recognized, they would see that the cost of doing this would be saving money. And right now, there's, it's not funded. And what about research? You can talk a little about the funding for research, basic research in pain? Yes, actually, um, there is another a federal strategy underway right now that, that Linda didn't yet mention, which is called the Federal Pain Research Strategy. It's a companion piece to the National Pain Strategy. Linda's also working on that. And the intent of that is to um, look at uh, what is needed in basic biomedical research. We do not yet understand the basic biological mechanism of pain in the human body. And because of that, we see that, you know, the, the you know, uh, treatments we have right now are inadequate. Um, so the kind of groundbreaking work that uh, Anne Louise is doing is not that well funded. Right now the NIH has a $30 billion a year budget, but less than 2% of it goes to basic biomedical pain research, and we really need to change that. So the federal pain uh, research strategy right now being worked on is an effort to point us in the right direction. That's going to need to be funded as well. So um, what about, let's return to this issue of kind of this, what you, you've talked about conflation between this chronic pain problem and the opioid uh, abuse problem. So Vaughn, can you tell us a bit about that? I mean, what exactly, uh, how do you avoid conflating these things to protect patients, but also from, from stigma, but also from the risk for addiction? Um, well, the, 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 that, is, that is the big challenge, I think, that we're, that we're seeking to try to resolve. Um, clearly, what we need to do is to, uh, to ensure that pain medication uh, meets the needs of chronic pain patients while reducing access to, uh, to uh, uh, opioid analgesics among those who uh, e are engaging in their use for recreational purposes or for, for uh, purposes of abuse. Um, We've seen a number of plans put in place uh, that have helped to reduce that, providing better information to patients, um, ensuring that patients don't make those medications available to other family members or friends. Uh, proper disposal of medications has been an important strategy. Um, we've seen the introduction of prescri prescription drug monitoring programs in virtually every state of the United States, which again have helped to reduce uh, our use of um, opioid medications um, uh, in, uh, uh, in a program appropriate ways. Um, we're also seeing better strategies to, uh, to reduce um, diversion of opioid medications, um, both from pl the place of manufacture and distribution, which, uh, which make their way into criminal black markets, um, as well as sales of, uh, of uh, illicit uh, opioid medications on the streets. So um, law enforcement strategies have also been somewhat helpful in uh, terms of reducing uh, the, the prevalence of use in, in that respect. But overwhelmingly, the, uh, the, the, the reason for the, uh, the substance or the opioid uh, uh, analgesic epidemic, um, abuse epidemic, is, is a consequence of um, pharma the pharmaceutical industry promoting these products in inappropriate ways, both to consumers and to prescribers. And, uh, and as we start to develop alternative strategies to opioid medications and we start to reduce uh, inappropriate promotional activities 
by the uh, pharmaceutical industry, we will see reduced demand for opioid medications at a population level. Something like 99% of uh, hydrocodone uh, medications prescribed globally are prescribed in the United States. And uh, that, that's a statistic which speaks to the power of the pharmaceutical industry in promoting that product um, at a national level. And uh, I think we are, we are, I think we recognise the need for alternatives for providing um, opioid medications in a safer way. Um, and I, I welcome the, uh, the, the, the plans that the, the panellists have described today. You want to ask any about your perspective on that also, but the, the, that statistic you mentioned, was it 99% of the prescriptions are written in the, for the U.S. patients? For, for hydrocodone. For hydrocodone. Vicodin. And why is it, um, what is so different about the U.S. than, say, Europe or other parts of the world? Well, I think we've, uh, I think we've got a, a very aggressive pharmaceutical industry that has uh, actively promoted the product in the U.S., and it's uh, partly a consequence of uh, uh, a number of factors, which include uh, prescriber preferences, patient preferences, and, uh, and federal regulations. Cindy, do you want to, do you have a different perspective on that? Or? Well, I do have a different perspective on that, and that is, I, I said, and Linda said, that 100 million Americans are living with pain. That is a lot of people living with pain. And I think at this point right now, because of all the, the um, you know, this sort of tamp down of, of prescribing, we've seen prescribing drop now. Uh, I think it's 25% prescribing is down. Yet the opioid overdose deaths are continuing. Why is that? Because I think we've moved beyond prescription opioids, which are now harder to get, and we have abuse deterrent formulations, and people, unfortunately, with the, uh, with the disease of substance abuse have moved to illegal substances, um, like illicit fentanyl that's coming into this country from overseas. And so, for example, the Massachusetts uh, Department of Public Health released data just a few days ago, and they've been doing some incredible groundbreaking breaking work in data showing that only 8% of people who died of opioid abuse between 2011 and 2014 uh, had a legitimate script for that medication. And so it's not the pain patient, uh, per se, that's, that's abusing the medication. Unfortunately, now uh, there are illegal substances coming in, and people with substance abuse who can't get the medicine any longer have now switched to that. And it's a huge problem. So we need to really work on um, substance abuse at the same time that we work on chronic pain. So I want to shift gears a bit. Um, and I'm not sure, we talked the other day, and I'm not sure if who's, whose term this was, but we talked in terms of an activated patient. If that's your term or your term, but Anne Louise, can you talk about from, from what, what advice, given your perspective, what advice you would have for patients that they're about to make sure, and you talked about having, seeing multiple pr practitioners, how can you be an activated patient to get the care that you need? You know, I think it's tough when you have chronic pain, you just, you don't feel well. A lot of people develop depression, difficulty exercising, income problems, as Cindy mentioned. But somehow it's very important to try and maintain some level of hope for the future and to persist, I think, and to push the healthcare system to try and allow you access to those physicians who might be able to find something new for you, to keep up with new discoveries that are being published, and not to just accept, well, this is all we can do, you're going to be like this for the rest of your life. So again, work, a lot of it uh, sponsored by the NIH, like our own work, is making new discoveries and offering new options to patients. I was working this morning on uh, our next NIH grant proposal. Did you hear that, Linda? I did. <laughs> Going in in February uh, about preparing for clinical trials of a whole new set of treatment options that have nothing whatsoever to do with pain pills or opioids for a specific subset of patients. But it sounds like a very inefficient process to keep at it, to keep at it, to keep at it. Isn't there a way to short circuit that to go straight to a practitioner who can give you the help that you need? The problem, as we've said several times, is education. One of the conditions that my group works on, uh, Tarlov cysts, is a completely unappreciated cause of back pain. Perhaps some of the people in the video we saw earlier might have that. And it's something that's actually visible on MRIs, but radiologists have been taught that Tarlov cysts never cause problems. And it's actually treatable with quite respectable results from procedures. The big problem is at the level of education. Most physicians, let alone other healthcare providers, have never heard about this. 
Fortunately, I'll put some of our papers on this topic, including the first one ever we got in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's the highest profile journal. I'll put it on the website so you can learn more. <laughs> Thank you. So do you want to talk briefly? We've only got a few minutes left before we start with our questions, but I want to get your perspective on this idea of the activated patient, you know, given your own experience. Absolutely, and I think you know, Anne Louise really made a good point about trying to continue to find things that help you. And you know, unfortunately though, for most people living with pain, there is no cure right now. And I think the first thing comes with accepting that we are not understanding it enough to find a cure. And therefore, you have to take an active role in managing the pain yourself. And I think the most uh, effective thing, as Linda mentioned, is to find a number of different treatments that work for you, that perhaps each one helps reduce the pain maybe 10 to 15 percent, and overall you're reducing the pain 50 or 60 percent, and you can function. And so it's individual. What works for one person doesn't work for anyone else or for, for other people often. So you have to find the right combination of treatments that work for you. And that requires you know, being actively aware and, and trying different things. So talking about trying different things, I wondered if, if everyone on the panel could wait on this question about these alternative or non-pharmaceutical approaches. And Linda, maybe you want to start. What's your perspective on the sorts of things that work that maybe need to be implemented more broadly? I think, you know, we're finding out now that so many of these non-pharmaceutical um, approaches are, are effective, especially when they're bundled together um, that and are directed to the needs of the individual. I think Cindy made a good point in that we're looking at, when we say chronic pain, we're looking at so many different pain conditions um, and so many different patients that respond individually. Um, but we do know um, for, for a number of different conditions that certain of the non-pharmacological approaches are effective. It's research-based. They are probably effective for other pain conditions as well, but the research hasn't been done. Um, so, you know, something as simple and um, probably very cost-effective as massage for low back and neck pain um, can be very helpful, especially when it's bundled into a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary package. And I, I think that integrated care is, is really an important component of the non-pharmacological non approach because it's typically not one individual treatment that's going to help the patient, but it's a package of patients that's designed to help that individual. It's not an easy way to manage a, a chronic problem, um, and it's not easy for the patient, and it's not easy for the physician. But, I, you know, the, the patient awareness awareness piece comes into this so that they know what their options are, they know what might be best for them, and they can work with a well-educated provider to know which of those treatments is best. And um, I know it's, it, it's a complicated picture, as you've said, so, one uh, step at a time. Yeah, and I wonder if you, you know, on the, on the, here on the panel, Annalise, do you want to talk about um, uh, the things that you think are most perhaps underused, the sorts of treatments from your perspective, non-pharmacologic treatments? I agree completely that we've relied too much on popping the pill, uh, which kind of fits well into our current healthcare model. And of course, those pills do help a lot of people, but there are entirely other strategies. Probably the single two most important alternative strategies that I see, number one is stopping smoking and improving cardiovascular risk factors. Because when you smoke, your blood vessels clamp down and it shuts off the blood flow to an area that may be diseased or not in good health. I've had chronic pain patients whose pain has been dramatically improved just by getting them to stop smoking. And weight, lo weight loss, of course, is very important for a number of diseases, including arthritis and musculoskeletal, uh, it, weight loss in many cases can reverse diabetes and diabetic neuropathy, which is a major cause of painful neuropathy here in the U.S. So it, when, we think, when we hear alternative treatments, we think about yoga and massage, but in addition to those effective treatments, there are other things that we can do even in our own homes that can have a direct impact. Um, well, we're, and thank you very much. We were talking earlier, too, and especially in light of the election here in, in Massachusetts, I guess recreational marijuana use has been approved as well as in California. So it seems like we're at the beginning of this new shift in our, in our drug policy. Uh, Vaughn, I wonder if you talk about 
marijuana specifically, but then also anything else that you think that is underused from your perspective that could help people uh, with, with chronic pain other than drugs? Sure. Well, I don't want to suggest that marijuana is underused, but uh, <laughs> ma ma marijuana uh, certainly uh, does have some analgesic benefits for many patients and is preferred uh, over opioid medications uh, because of uh, the, different, the different qualities that it has, both in terms of its uh, analgesic uh, qualities as, as well as uh, its other psychological Active effects. Um, as we've seen uh, uh, new marijuana laws introduced uh, at a state by state uh, basis, uh, including medical marijuana laws, decriminalization, and, and indeed legalization, we've seen an uptake in marijuana use in, uh, in virtually all of those jurisdictions. What we find interesting is that, uh, particularly in those states with medical marijuana laws, we've seen a decline in the use of opioid medications. Uh, which suggests we're not we're not completely sure we understand what's going on there, but it does suggest at least that uh, that that patients who are making use of uh, opioid analgesics are making a switch to or preferring uh, marijuana. The long-term consequences of that we don't completely understand, and of course we do have concerns um, about uh, about uh, uptake in use of marijuana, particularly among youth. So um, so there may be uh, you know some some potential benefits, but of course risks of uh, of introducing decriminalisation and indeed legalization of uh, marijuana. Uh, but it does provide one, al one potential alternative and there are some pharmaceutical uh, products that, uh, that have been uh, um, uh, approved by the FDA for the purpose of, uh, of uh, analgesia, among other effects. Um, but in addition to marijuana, of course, there are, um, as Linda has mentioned, you know, there are some great uh, non-pharmaceutical strategies and I, and I would also include to the list that she's mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps uh, patients to think differently about the pain and to, uh, to to gain some mastery or management over negative thinking or catastrophic thinking that often um, causes pain symptoms to become worse. Um, and uh, exercise therapy has been particularly helpful for, for many individuals. And the use of those strategies, those uh, psychological interventions, uh, in combination with pharmaceutical or pharmacological uh, approaches uh, may, be, may be particularly beneficial and reduce reliance on pharmacological um, methods of, uh, of providing analgesia. So, uh, we, you know, there are, there are options and, uh, and the research base is rapidly developing um, to help to literally loosen our, our, our dependence on opioid analgesia. So, and what about your experience? I know you shift your posture some, right? That's, you, that's one way that you deal with your pain. What, what things have you found to be most helpful for your, your pain? So if, what I do is a combination of things. I use medication and I um, limit the amount of time that I'm upright. Literally, I'm up an hour and I lie down for 25 minutes and that helps me control the level of pain I experience. I do an exercise program, a water-based program and a land-based exercise program. And com combining all those things enables me to, to function while still living with pain, uh, but ha having it much reduced. Thank you. Okay, I think now Lisa's got some questions for us. I do. Thanks a lot, David. We do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, this is one from our live chat. What advice do your experts have for those chronic pain patients whose doctors will no longer provide opioid treatment? Many have been on these treatments successfully for 10 to 15 years and are just cut off with a final 30-day supply. If they cannot find a new doctor, should they go to the ER, methadone clinics? What should they do? These people are lost in pain and don't know where to turn. I'm thinking of, well, and Lise and, and also you, who, who wants to weigh in on that question? Well, I can weigh in on it from the perspective of a provider. I think yeah. you can weigh in on it from other perspectives as well. But as a physician, I hear this story from some of my patients. And I think it's tragic. And it's just really not called for in many cases. The patients are very stable people who've been using their medication stably, sometimes for decades. Um, and what I have advised patients to do is, is if they're not able to find another provider, that they contact their state board of medical registration and let them know that this has been done so that the board can look into it and make sure that it's not part of a larger problem with that particular medical practice. And, it, and they, the board may be able to help direct them to more suitable providers. 
you want to weigh in? Too. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, that is a, it's a huge problem right now, and the advocacy groups are hearing from many people now who are uh, not only uh, not able to get the, the opioid medications they need, but doctors are not wanting to treat people with chronic pain. And we've even had a nurse on the board of Mass PI uh, text us a picture in a doctor's office in Springfield that said, we no longer treat chronic pain patients. Mm -hmm. Literally, people with pain are being turned away, uh, and doctors are so fearful. Why is that? Because lawmakers, unfortunately policymakers, have had sort of this knee-jerk reaction and said, oh my God, all opioids are bad, therefore we have to do everything we can to limit their use down to almost nothing. Uh, and so now uh, doctors are so afraid to prescribe that uh, they don't want to prescribe and they don't want to see chronic pain patients. It's a huge problem, and I think the pendulum has just swung too far in the other direction right now. And I think we also have to mention that a lot of this is prompted not so much by that individual patient, but by that provider's fear of being sued, whether... Or brought before the board. Or, or brought whatever. before the board. I mean, right now in Massachusetts, in the, in the bill that we just recently had, and it'll give you a sense of why doctors feel this way, uh, is that lawmakers now uh, have written into the law now that passed in March um, that uh, every doctor's prescribing, amount of prescribing is going to be um, monitored by, by the Department of Public Health, and anyone who is above the mean or median of uh, their kind of practice group is going to get a letter from the medical board uh, about their prescribing. And so as a doctor and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get a letter from the medical board, uh, I too as a doctor would be afraid to prescribe anymore. And that is law now in Massachusetts. Thank you for addressing this because we have had a number of questions about this as well, so thank you. Shall I take another, another one? This is from Facebook. Can the panel talk about chronic pain induced by emotional trauma rather than by physical trauma as the underlying trigger? We have had a couple of questions about that, so I wanted to ask. I would say as a neuroscientist, there is an emerging literature about the effects of emotional trauma, particularly in, in the young. In children, or in many cases, these are animal experiments in young animals. And there is evidence that some of these early traumas can indeed cause changes in the way the nervous system develops. I don't think that this really has practical applications yet in terms of treating the person on the street, but nonetheless, scientists are beginning to pay attention. And Linda, you might have a comment about that as well. Yeah, I, I think research is really beginning to, to understand that um, there's a certain period in early life where emotional trauma or physical trauma can make people more susceptible to chronic pain conditions later in life. And so as we move forward with the, national, with the federal pain research strategy, which Cindy mentioned, um, that's a, an a an effort to put together a long-term strategy of how we direct pain research to, to sort of improve the agenda and improve the outcome of the research dollars that we spend. And a lot of the conversations there have focused on the need for more research in that area because there, there does be, appear to be um, perhaps a certain age at which there's a susceptibility that is stronger if there is some kind of early trauma um, to lead to chronic pain later in life. And so even the beginning to identify that window of time, whether early interventions post that kind of trauma could help prevent later chronic pain, those are all big questions that are looming out there now and clearly things that are gonna rise to the research priorities that are recommended um, for the federal government to focus their research dollars on in the upcoming future. Important area. Would the intervention possibly be therapy at that point? I mean, what sorts of interventions might there be if there's an injury or something at an early age? Therapy would certainly be one of them, um, you know, especially if, if these individuals could be identified as in need. Um, there, there could be, um, you know, if there is an initial pain insult, physical pain insult resulting from the trauma, then there could be also. Um, kinds of interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy or exercise, rehab therapies that you would associate more with a pain condition. But clearly the psychological therapy is likely to be an important component of that. 
Did you want to add something? I, I would just add something to that. I think looking a little more broadly um, um, among uh, psychiatric symptoms and, and trauma alone, um, other, other uh, comorbid psychiatric problems can also enhance the perception of pain, including anxiety problems, problems with depression. Mm -hmm. And it is among patients with those sorts of concerns that we see increased risk for development of problems of substance use. And so that, that represents a, you know, a particularly high, high risk group. And, and, uh, and I, I'm not clear on the, on the data on this, but I, I, would, uh, I would wonder also whether, the, the, whether those with a history of trauma might also be at risk of uh, problems of, uh, of uh, opioid-related substance use and uh, for which uh, better or alternative types of uh, interventions are recommended. Another question? Okay. We're running out of time. We have a lot of questions, and you all can go on our chat and see those. I just I'm wondering if anyone from the studio has a question. Yes, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the intersection of mental uh, mental illness and chronic pain. And uh, it was mentioned that chronic pain can cause mental illness. How about the management of the mental illness aspect of chronic pain and the intersection between that and problems of addiction? Um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a very important question. Um, I'm, I think that there is a relationship between uh, psychiatric symptoms and, uh, and perception of pain. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, that there is also clearly a, a link between uh, e the experience of uh, symptoms of anxiety uh, and depressive disorders and uh, increased likelihood of substance use. Uh, so I think this represents uh, an important area um, uh, that, that, that suggests vulnerability for, uh, for uh, uh, problems of substance use as well as for increased uh, uh, chronic pain problems and uh, we, 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 need to, uh, we need to engage in efforts to understand that more effectively to manage uh, problems of, for those patients uh, better clinically. Yeah, I do want to comment on that. Um, I'm glad you brought that up as a good point. And if you think about what I describe when I talk about the experience of living with pain, if you can picture yourself living with this kind of pain 24-7 and what it does to your life, um, I've had people in my pain group whose spouses have left them, they can't take care of their children, they can't make social plans, and so your world gets smaller and smaller, and oftentimes people become incredibly isolated, and the combination of that um, often can lead to depression. Uh, and so I encourage people that are experiencing pain to get counseling because it affects so many other aspects of your life. I mean, I'll never forget this really amazing story that Phil Pizzo, who is the former dean of Stanford Medical School that chaired the IOM committee, uh, he himself, after the report was released about pain, experienced pain himself, a doctor, uh, and he ultimately uh, had such severe pain, he described the fact that he was dean of Stanford Medical School and he wasn't leaving his house. And he became so depressed, clinically depressed, um, until he managed to push for a diagnosis like Anne Louise had talked about uh, and ultimately got help for his pain. But I mean, imagine something like that uh, and, that, and this you know, chronic pain doing that to them. So I think it's a really important point and people should seek counseling. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, yeah. go ahead, Linda. Oh, sorry, I, very briefly here too. I, I, we also know that some of the brain circuitry that's involved in pain and depression and anxiety, anxiety and the reward circuitry that's related to depression are overlapping in a number of different areas. And we're, we're beginning to understand that. And I think that'll help in as far as treatment approaches. And Louise? Well, I was just gonna say at a practical level, if I see that I have a patient with substantial chronic pain, I always try to ask them. I say, how are you coping with this? If I were you, I would be depressed. How are you doing? And I emphasize that it's not that I think their depression is the cause of their chronic pain, but I say, look, we may not have great treatments for your pain, but there's quite reasonable treatments for depression out there. So why don't we at least treat that part of your difficulty that we have effective treatments for? And I would encourage patients as well not to conceal this from their physicians, but to bring it up very openly. There is treatment. 
So we're running out of time, but really quickly, I think we have time. Uh, the, the, there's a, uh, if, what if each of you could offer a policy takeaway? And my understanding is that these will be collected and distributed to some policy, some uh, influencers specifically. So do you want to start, uh, Cindy? What do you think? What's the policy takeaway for yeah, you, as quickly? Person, as a person who lives in the policy world, I can think of a <laughs> lot of them. Um, but you know, my number one thing, I guess, would say to dramatically increase the research, pain research budget, because we need to find more effective treatment options. And I think yeah, Anne Louise would probably agree agree with that. Um, just one thing I'd say more quickly also is that um, in terms of um, lawmakers, particularly at the, at the state level, I'd like them to understand that uh, people with pain need to be at the table when you're making decisions, and that to try to find balanced approaches that don't harm one group while helping another. Uh, I, I would suggest that we need to reduce the, uh, the, the prevalence of uh, opioid analgesic medications uh, across communities in the United States and replace them with, uh, with, with better options. Of course, these medications need to continue to be made available for, uh, for patients with, uh, with chronic pain uh, problems, but we need to do a better job of, uh, of prescribing them, monitoring that prescription, uh, screening uh, patients that uh, have a, a potential for um, abusing such medications or uh, being involved in the diversion of those medications to, uh, to the, the streets of the communities from where they come from. So we need to strike that balance, but uh, but overwhelmingly, we need to uh, reduce our reliance on opioid medications, reduce the prevalence of their use across communities, um, and, uh, and seek better, um, safer alternatives. And I'm going to say something odd for a clinician and a researcher, but I think we need to do better with getting the message out to other healthcare providers and to the public about the discoveries in many cases that have already been made an opportunity like this to speak to a large audience is terrific. Far more people will watch this than read my papers in some persnickety <laughs> medical journal. So let's find ways to disseminate the research that the NIH is funding and get it out to help patients faster, quicker, better. And Linda, how about you? Um, all of the above, obviously. The, what I would add to that is um, I, I think what we need to do is, is really start to move towards a payment system that covers multidisciplinary care for people with chronic pain and that the, the public payers can take the lead with that and, and as we understand better how that benefits both the payer and especially the outcomes for the patients to start to move in that direction. Okay, well, I think that about ends it. Linda, thank you very much. Anne Louise, thank you. Vaughn, Cindy, thank you very much. And I'll encourage the people who are uh, watching online that the conversation continues on the forum website, forumhsph.org. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you all for the panelists. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.